Welcome to Catalyst at Home. We are so glad you are joining us. Uh, it's a special Sunday because Christine and I are both here, uh, going to be bringing a message on marriage today uh, that I believe is going to be applicable to whatever season you find yourself in. Uh, if you're new to Catalyst, we're so glad you're here. Uh, as always, you'll see below, uh, you can text Catalyst to 94000. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to send you a gift, say thank you for joining us. Any way we can help you get connected in this season, would love uh, to do so. And uh, Catalyst family, before we dive into the message, uh, I want to share with you a few things. Uh, we are now a couple weeks into our group semester. Come on, if you are in a community group or faith and life course, show some love to that group in the chat. Uh, I know uh, I, I've been enjoying the groups that I'm a part of thus far. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're not yet connected, get connected. Uh, you can sign up on our website, or you can text. You'll see uh, a phrase below to 94,000 that you can text in. Uh, sign up for your group today. There's still time to jump in. Um, as well, uh, at the end of this month, towards the end of this month, as we're kicking off a brand new month, October 24th, uh, we're going to be having an outdoor worship service. It's on a Saturday at 4 o'clock, uh, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, we had one back in September, and uh, so many of you commented on how much you enjoyed it. We're asking when's the next one, and uh, we look forward to gathering together to worship together. Uh, it's going to be a great evening. And as, as always, afterwards, we are going to have an after party uh, with uh, a food truck, uh, Empanadas de Mendoza food truck. It's going to be a great time to worship together, to gather and connect as a family. Uh, we're going to, again, as always, keep everything very clean, very safe, following all the guidelines. Your safety is our of utmost priority, uh, but it's going to be a great, great time again as we worship. Uh, you can text the phrase Catalyst Worship, all one word, to 94000 to register, or you can register via our website uh, as well. But excited today to dive into part three of Relationship Goals. Uh, we've entitled today's conversation, Marriage Vows. Uh, we're going to be talking about three promises that we want to encourage you from God's word to commit to, uh, to truly experience uh, God's best in your marriage. But before we dive in to God's word, let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for your word. We thank you. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path. We pray that as we speak about the topic of marriage, uh, uh, Lord, this relationship, Lord, that you have set forth uh, since the beginning of time between a husband and wife, God, that you would, through your word, give us guidance, God, speak life into, into marriages, God. Uh, give us instruction, God. We posture our heart and our mind to receive from you today. God, may you speak through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And today, like Jeremy said, we're going to be talking about three promises uh, that we need to make in order to have healthy biblical marriages. And we want to jump off in Ephesians 5, 31 through 33 as kind of a foundational text. Um, and you can read with me on the screen. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his, love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And we see here the, purposes, the purpose for marriage is really revealed here. And it's, just, it's not about just happiness or companionship or all of the things, the romance that the world tells us about. Um, and those are all beautiful benefits of this, this wonderful union we call marriage, but it's about so much more. And, and there's there's an invitation here into a divine purpose that our relationships would glorify God together as we do life on purpose to be a light for Christ in our world. Awesome. And so often, uh, I don't know about you, but we hear about God's heart intent for marriage. And sometimes, I don't know if you've experienced this, if you're married or uh, maybe even if you hope to be married one day, maybe you've, you are experiencing this. We always have expectations, uh, whether or not we're fully aware of them, but sometimes what can happen in the context of marriage, we can have these expectations entering into marriage, and then come on several years in, maybe even several months in, maybe for some of you several weeks in, <laughs> those expectations may not line up. I was reminded of the power of unmet expectations and the times frustration it can cause. Uh, we went on a, a family vacation this summer with our kids, and um, one of the places I was going to take our, our kids, our two older ones, uh, was this go-kart place. 
And we, we saw the brochure. We had looked at the website. We had had a conversation. Like, Judah was fired up. We were excited. Like, this is going to be amazing. We're going to ride go-karts, go on these rides. So we walk up, we drive up to the go-kart place, and then realize that online it looked about three times the size it actually was. And then to even make matters a little bit, a little bit worse, about half the park was closed, uh, one due to COVID restrictions, and some of the, the rides were just not operating. And then we get in and we realize uh, that Hannah and Judah were not tall enough to ride many of the rides that remained. So needless to say, we were all somewhat disappointed um, by what we were expecting and what we were ended up experiencing. Come on, we made the best of it, uh, but there was a, a, a tension, a frustration because of unmet expectations. And maybe you've experienced that in marriage. We can enter into marriage with these expectations that, come on, it's just going to be like a, a rom-com. Come on, somebody, it's just going to be, we're going to have these getaways and these beautiful long dinners, and then you have children. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you, you think it's going to be uh, just one way, and oftentimes there can be this tension because what you have dreamt about, what you had thought about before you got married may not be what you're experiencing in marriage. And the reality is that dynamics change because of work responsibilities and, and children and home responsibilities and just life happens. But here's the beautiful thing. God's word gives us instruction and guidance on how we can experience his best. And that's our hope for you. And our hope today uh, is to give you some instruction from his word. Uh, this isn't Jeremy and Christina's thoughts uh, these are God's thoughts on how we can experience his best. And we're also a work in progress. Uh, we, we are 10 years into marriage. We have not aced all of this, but we are, we are pursuing this. So I want to encourage you to have a posture in your heart um, to receive this today, uh, to experience God's best. We're going to share with you three promises we want to challenge you to make uh, in your marriage uh, to believe to experience God's best. Here's the first one. First promise, that I promise to pursue my spouse. Uh, Genesis 2.24, uh, a scripture that even Jesus himself referenced in, in reference to marriage, says this. This is why a man leaves his father and mother. A uh, little side note, leave your father and mother. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, is united to his wife. And they become one flesh. That word leave means to forsake or to relinquish, to, to, to leave behind uh, your family of origin as you're forming this new family. You still have a relationship, but the relationship changes. And that word united, it actually means to cling or adhere to, to catch by pursuit, to pursue hard. There's an intentionality. There's a pursuit. And what can happen, uh, especially I'll even speak to men as I myself am one, that we can pursue our spouse while we're dating. And we can pursue her hard. Come on, buy her flowers, do romantic things, open the car door for her, you know, do all of these things, cook her favorite dinner. But sometimes once we get married, sometimes that pursuit can, can begin to, we, we kind of drift away from it. And we also live in a culture, I can just speak to this, live in a culture that puts a priority upon pursuing your vocational career. Like we know how to get the degrees we need, go to the networking events that we need, do the different things that we need in order to pursue that career of our dreams. But then culturally, we sort of drift through marriage. Listen, and I believe God's heart for us is not to drift through marriage, but to pursue our spouse. I heard one time a mentor tell me this, to earn a PhD in your spouse. Come on, you know how to earn a degree for your job. Now earn a PhD by learning your spouse and pursuing your spouse. Here's a, here's a truth, is that, is that a great marriage does not happen by accident. A great marriage requires intentionality. I remember some years ago, we were at a, a Disney World with our kids, and we had had this, this plan for the day. We wanted to hit, come on the Dumbo ride, come on Aladdin's magic carpets, come on, see all the princesses for Hannah. We had, we had this plan, right? Come on, Peter Pan, the Winnie the Pooh ride, which are great wives, by the way. Uh, so we had all of these goals, but it required intentionality. Why? Because the lines are long. So the whole day, I was pursuing this plan because I was on the, fat, the app with the fast passes. Come on, somebody. We got done the first three rides via fast pass by 11. Got the next three rides done by 1230. The next three rides. And I was just continually, we ended up by like about 4 p.m. We had, we had been on all of the rides, seen all of the characters we wanted to see. We were exhausted. Why? Because there was intentionality. 
And your marriage requires that intentionality. Have a plan and stick to it. Let me give you just some quick practicals from God's word in pursuing your spouse. Here's the first one, is that when you think of something good to say, say it. Uh, Hebrews 3.13, the author of Hebrews writes, encourage one another daily. Encourage one another every single day. Ephesians 4.29, Paul says it this way, to, to, to use our words to build up one another. Let no unwholesome word come from our mouth, but only that for building up each other. Use words that are gonna build up your spouse. Give courage to your spouse. And can I tell you in this pandemic, how many know we need encouragement more than any other time, probably, because life looks different. There, there, there are stressors that are, that are upon your life. The work dynamic has changed. And come on, some of you, you're not only a parent, but also now helping your child with virtual school. You're, you're having to, to, to unique ways, care for your kids in this season. And, and all of that, we, we all need some encouragement. And here's the power of encouragement. Daniel Goldman in his book, Social Intelligence, found that encouraging words can actually lead to positive emotions. And then catch this, it enhances our mental abilities, such as creative thinking and cognitive flexibility in the processing of information. That when you encourage your spouse, you're enabling them, you're empowering them to be more creative, to be more cognitively flexible, to help to process information. I would encourage you to be encouraging in this season to your spouse. A few months back, after one of our Catalyst at Home services, uh, we had gotten done and, and Christina came to me and she said, babe, that was a really great message. Can I tell you, all of a sudden, I, I kind of puff my chest out a little bit. Come on, I'm like, all right, say it again. Come on, say it again. I'm going to record it. Uh, it, it. But it gave me, that, that simple phrase gave me so much encouragement. Uh, something I've been, I've been trying to do, be more intentional about, just knowing as, as Christina has been incredible at the, all the different roles, uh, from leading here at the church alongside me, from uh, helping to parent our kids, and as well, and really leading the way with Hannah's virtual school, and being an incredible wife is, I've been trying to be intentional of stopping and looking at her. And if I've been doing this, you can nod, or if not, just shake your head. This is full integrity right here. Um, and just reminding her that you are doing an incredible job in this season, leading here at the church, taking care of our kids, leading the way with Hannah's school, and being an incredible wife. Thanks, babe. Uh, I want to do it as well before you all. But I'm telling you, encouragement. Right now, if your spouse is near you, come on, you can turn away from the screen. You have full permission and encourage them. Be specific. Hey, the way you did that the other day, come on, the way you, you, you took care of the kids, the, the way you made that dinner, come on, just encourage, encourage, encourage. If your spouse is at work, send them a text message, encouragement. Number two, it's when you think of something good to do or special to do, do it. James 4, 17, if anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin. It's pretty harsh words. Uh, there's something powerful in doing good. In fact, this is intriguing. The Journal of Social Psychology in 2010 found that acts of kindness actually increases your level of happiness. Come on, you want a happy marriage? Do good. <laughs> do something good for your spouse today. Come on, do, do something. Uh, might be. I remember some years ago, uh, I had uh, surprised Christina when she was at work uh, by sending her some flowers. Come on, in the middle of the afternoon. So she received flowers in front of all of her coworkers. Come on, trying to earn some extra points there. Um, and, and in this season, doing good, I have found uh, with her, with three kids, is doing the dishes. Come on, somebody. That's a word for you right now. Just do the dishes. Cook some dinner. In fact, it's funny that the Journal of Marriage and Family actually found that, catch this. Come on, husbands, take notes. If you've never taken notes before in church, take notes right now. That actually wives find their husband more physically and sexually attractive when they clean the house. Come on, some of you men will clean the house for the first time in your life. You're like, hey, where's the vacuum? Come on, clean the house. <laughs> I'm just trying to help marriages out, being real practical. But do good, do, do something, send the flowers. Write, write the encouraging uh, note. Bathe the kids tonight. Come on, somebody. Cook dinner, do 
good for your spouse today. And then lastly is this, is that when you want something different, be it. When you think of something good, say it. When you think of something good or special, do it. And then when you want something different, be it. This is the, the Lord speaking to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4, and 5. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you fall and repent and do the things you did at first. He, he was reminding them that in, in his relationship with them, hey, listen, come back to your first love. Do the things you once did. Now, let me encourage you with this. To get what you once had in your marriage, you must do what you once did. And, and, all, and one of the things that I had done when we were dating, uh, I pursued Christina by cooking dinner often. Come on, a little bit of s- salmon, uh, some sautéed vegetables, roasted potatoes. Come on, give me a little bit of menu for your lunch today. Uh, I'd bake desserts. And, and to be honest, uh, some, some time went by in our marriage um, where I really just kind of fell away from cooking. And... Uh, even recently, the, the Lord just kind of even prompted me of just stepping into this more, that this is a pursuing of her heart. In fact, the other day, uh, she came home with the kids. They were out, and, and I said, hey, tonight I'm, I'm making chicken fajitas. And I explained to her what I was going to be doing, and she literally did a little bit of dance in the kitchen. Come on, somebody. Uh, but listen, to, to get what you once had, you must do what you once did. And then, listen, for some of you, to get what you've never had, you must do what you've never done. Some of you, 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 you've yet to establish a date night. You need to do that. Maybe some of you, you're like, I've never cooked dinner for my spouse. Maybe do that. Maybe you've never sent flowers to her. Do that. Do, to get what you've never had, you must do what you've never done. Come on, let's promise to pursue our spouse. You know, before Jeremy and I were married, you know, Jeremy was just pursuing my heart. I mean, this guy, I would tell him, no, I don't want to go to dinner. And he would just continue. He's like, well, you have to eat. I mean, he was doing every excuse. He was trying to like basically get rid of all of my excuses. And, you know, when Jeremy began to pursue me, um, it reminded me so much of God's pursuit of my heart. I felt God was relentless as Jeremy was being relentless. And this is a nugget for someone. That is how I knew that God was in our relationship because he reminded me of a familiar love, a love that could only come from God. And um, over time, you know, what happens is we begin to kind of take each other for granted and things begin to get familiar and you don't thank each other anymore for, you know, doing dishes or for putting up laundry or just the basics, taking out the trash. And over time, you know, these these home tasks begin to wear on you and, um, you know, it's amazing what a little bit of encouragement or acknowledgement can do. And so that's even something transparently I'm working on is really noticing, right? Right, noticing those things that I once noticed. Um, and really, this is an ongoing process because the more that you add to your lives, especially when kids come along, when they really do take a lot of energy. And so your, your mental and emotional bandwidth is being taken up by other things, especially with work and with kids. And then you, you, what you find is you begin to kind of make compromises in the relationship area. And I have to credit Jeremy for this, but whenever I would begin to, you know, be tempted to kind of say like, it's okay, we haven't had a date night in a couple weeks or, you know, make excuses because I was just exhausted. Um, Jeremy would really fight for us and he would fight for that time. Even if it mean like whisking me away, you know, twice a year for a couple days just to get alone time together. It was incredibly, incredibly impactful. And I love that because it reminds me of the pursuit that we first, you know, that when he first started pursuing me which leads us to our second promise. So I promise to be about we and not me. You know, we all have to make a conscious choice to fight for unity, you know, because left to ourselves, we all drift towards just self-centeredness. This is humanity. And without God, it is impossible to lay our lives down one for another. And, and our spouses are not our enemy. In fact, it isn't even a competition. And so for all of the achievers out there, my type A's, my Enneagram 3's, tuning in today, this one's for you. It's not a competition. It is, it, it, we, we, are, we are made to complement one another, to strengthen the team uh, together. And uh, for me, that was a hard thing for me to really learn and renew my mind on and, you know, really pay attention to the behaviors and the things going on in my heart for a long time. But, you know, the truth is that we actually do have a common enemy. And this enemy, um, you know, our best chance at actually overcoming 
the enemy is being on the same page, right? And when you're beginning to rub each other in the wrong way, taking a time out and saying, you know what? This, this is not us. This is not what we want. This is not who we are. There's an enemy at work. In fact, Satan works relentlessly to sow discord and disunity in families because he knows that when brokenness happens in the family unit, unfortunately what happens is it, it, it repeats itself repetitively in generations. And we see this dysfunction continue unless someone steps up and says it stops with me. And we all have the power to do that because of what Jesus has done on the cross. The story can be different for us, for you. Um, you know, and the more that marriages and couples become about we and we begin to become more like Christ in all of our life, the enemy hates it because he hates humanity because we are made in God's image. We remind him of his defeat, especially when we, when we fulfill the great commandments of loving God with all of our heart, in loving others, it is impossible to love others, especially your spouse that you live with day in, day out, unless you first keep that relationship with Christ. John 10, 10 says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is giving us here, he is giving us a framework for how to overcome in our marriages. You know, Matthew 19, four through six, I love that Jesus is actually talking about the kingdom of God, he's contrasting it to the culture, and then we've got Pharisees coming up, kind of their religious leaders of the day, and they're really asking Jesus some tricky questions in hopes to kind of make him out to be a false teacher, and they're asking him questions about marriage, and he says this in verse four, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This word united in the Hebrew actually means completely joined. And so this even goes beyond kind of the marriage consummation physically, but it's really this knitting together of our souls. And we know that Christ made both male and female in his image, and then he called it good. And so he's saying, this is actually my plan, and I call it good. Um, we also know that God created Adam, and he gave some, him some work to do, but then he realized, you know, there was no suitable helper, and so he creates Eve, he creates woman out of the man, and we see in Genesis 2.18, he says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, ladies, I used to have a real challenge with this label of helper. Um, I, it, my kind of go-getter attitude, personality type, I had a real, real challenge with this kind of idea um, of, you know, God's framework for marriage and then I'm supposed to be a helper um, because I had all kind of cultural connotations that went along with that until I kind of, I took it, I said, God, I love you with all of my heart and I'm gonna seek you with everything that I have and I don't understand your ways, I don't understand your structure, but I'm gonna seek out knowledge and understanding and then I'm gonna submit myself to you because I love you and I trust that you have a good plan for me and it is not to harm me, but it is to give, bring me life. And so as I began to learn this, what I found was that God is actually referred to as a helper many times over in the Bible. In fact, the King, King David actually calls him, God is my helper, the upholder of our lives in Psalms 54, four. And the Holy Spirit, in fact, the third part of the Trinity is actually referred to as the helper. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to live this life that God says is possible, even though with man it can feel impossible, with God it is possible because the Holy Spirit comes and helps us. And what I realized was like, man, God, what an honor, what the highest honor of my life. I had to change my mind that the God of the universe is comparing me and calling me into the role of helper and that I am able to display this, this particular dimension of God that is unique to being female. And I'm telling you, I walked with a different kind of confidence that, man, God, you didn't make a mistake. You've created me as a woman. You have created me in this structure of the family unit, and I'm gonna honor it because you have put it in motion. So 
with that framework, really want to share two commitments that we believe that you can make uh, to kind of take this step towards a we mentality for your marriage. And, you know, becoming we is a difficult process. And it is a difficult process whether you are putting God first or not, but it is really difficult if you have not learned first to have that relationship with Jesus above all else. And so the first commitment is to commit to honor Christ in your marriage. You know, it's impossible to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, honor God with my marriage if we haven't fully surrendered. And so really, this is the first commitment. God, I surrender all. And 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. This is a person, a relationship, someone who has fallen deeply in love and trusts deeply their Savior. And we're all on different spectrums. We are all on different journeys. But as we walk with God, there's certain areas, and you maybe even you feel, you know this area right now that God's maybe tugging on you this morning, like that, that he's, he's not asking to take away. He's asking to give life, to heal certain areas that maybe we've held too tightly. And so this particular area of marriage, what does it practically mean? It means saying, God, if I've tried to do this myself, like, God, I, I, I am committed to you first and foremost. Therefore, you can have my marriage, and I need your help. And so this self-sufficiency of, like, I can do it myself, um, I, I don't know about you, but marriage is hard enough. And so trying to do marriage well by yourself is a disaster. <laughs> and so giving God committing, hey, I'm gonna honor you, 1 Corinthians 10, I'm gonna honor you in every aspect of my life, especially my marriage. In fact, um, I was taught a long time ago, I kind of, this visual really helped me, but if you can imagine a triangle, um, and what it looks like is that as each triangle kind of represents the, the sides of this triangle are the individuals, and we're leaning in towards God. We are looking up for him, right? Each individual has their own connection, their own pursuit of God. And as we do that together, he remains the center of our relationships. It looks a lot easier than it is to do it, but God is saying you're not alone. In fact, a threefold cord cannot be easily broken and that I am with you and I am for you and you can do this together. The second commitment is a commitment to a common mission. The Bible is very clear that the purpose of our marriages is to glorify God through our lives, the, the, the fruit of our lives, if you will. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two people are better off than one. In the New Living Translation, it says, for they can help each other succeed. Now, I just want to affirm you for a moment because, um, you know, sometimes we think like everything has to go out the window when I get married. But I want to affirm you that God had a purpose and a plan for your life. He formed you in your mother's room long before you were synced up with your spouse. And so I want to remind you that God has a purpose together, but he also has an, in, he has individual things that he's put on the inside of you and they are not to be buried. Now, sometimes they have to be put away for certain time periods as we yield one to another in the seasons of our life. But it is so important. May our marriages be about, you know what? I love you so much, Jeremy. I love you so much to your spouse is saying like, I'm gonna commit my life to loving you so well that we're gonna pull out everything that God has intended on the inside of you with his help and being committed to that mutually. Sometimes we see a lot of one-sidedness and, 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 and it's saying like, no, I'm going to submit myself to God and love you well and serve you well. I'm gonna outserve you and we're gonna see the beautiful uh, calling of God God call, you know, come forth in your life. Ephesians 5.21 says it this way, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it goes back to commitment number one. Do you revere God enough to love your spouse well? And they go together. We love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then we love our neighbor as ourselves. And there is an order to that because God is a strategic God, and he knows that we've got to get the order and positioning of our heart right. You know, for the first couple years of our marriage, I really resisted the process of we, um, especially that kind of M. I was more like the H, where I was like, I'm over here, you're over here, and like, you know, yes, we're married. Um, but there was just a lot. God had so much more. He had so much more. And I really valued, and I would even say idolized my independence. Um, and I had, 
you know, just struggled to yield that stubbornness um, and really submit myself one to another. And quite frankly, the issue wasn't even with that. The issue was actually with accepting and getting under the mission of God and getting under and trusting that his structure for family was good and that his plans were good for me. And so, you know, as you begin to unpack why you struggle with those things, what you find is a bunch of lies that have been planted in your heart and in your mind, and you have to take them out one at a time, just like we weed a garden. And you know what? Sometimes you take them out, and you know what? You neglect your garden, and they come back. And so you've got to keep weeding the garden of your heart so that you can, you can, you know, have a soil, your heart, in a place where you can have a we relationship. You know, I would encourage you, if you have not done this, to really take the time to, to, to do this individually. But also, what helped me a lot was kind of reframing submission. And this is my challenge to you, that you would see, you know what, I am going to submit myself to God, and I'm gonna submit myself. I'm gonna get under his plan and his ways, and I'm gonna give it a try with all of my heart. I'm gonna submit to the vision of God. And I can tell you so many times, had I not had these two commitments in my life, I don't know that we would even be where we're at today, loving each other, um, because it takes being committed. I'm committed to God, I'm committed to this relationship, and I'm gonna submit my will and my flesh under the mission of God for our relationship. Which brings us to our final point, is that I promise to confide in my spouse and not hide from my spouse. Genesis 2.25, that Adam and his wife then were both naked and felt no shame. Come on, everybody said amen. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> they were both naked and they felt no shame. They, they were totally revealed to each other and felt no shame. The word shame actually means worthlessness. It means that they, had, they had this feeling of worth and and being completely with each other. You know, we see when, when sin entered the picture, they ended up covering up themselves. Uh, because oftentimes what can happen is that shame makes you want to hide. And here, here's the reality is that secrecy, I want you to catch this, it is the enemy of intimacy. And here's what shame, shame grows in the dark, but healing in our marriage happens in the light. Paul said this in Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once in darkness, but you are now the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. To, to, to have, have this openness, have this transparency. We talk all the time about James 5, 16, confess your sin one to another so you can experience healing. And I believe that should start first and foremost in your marriage, is to have that openness with one another. J, or, or Paul in Ephesians 5, 3, kind of speaking more of what light looks like. He says that this, that among you, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because they're improper for God's people. Some part of, of the walking in the light is, is experiencing purity when it comes to your sexuality, especially in the context of marriage. Listen, mar marital purity requires intentionality. Some years ago, I was driving home. Uh, I was in college for Thanksgiving, it was Wednesday evening, the night before Thanksgiving, I was getting tired at the wheel, and I fell asleep. First time and only time I fell asleep at the wheel, thank you, Jesus. I drifted into the other lane, I hit the guardrail, I then tossed over the other side, I slammed into the guardrail, my car is totaled. Thankfully, I was fine. I did wake up, though. Um, but if it wasn't for those guardrails, those guardrails saved my life. I made a bad decision. I didn't sleep all the night before. I was tired. But those guardrails saved my life. Can I tell you, you need guardrails in your marriage for your purity. Here's what guardrails look like. Putting, especially if you, if you have had maybe struggles in the past with sexual sin, whether it be pornography or it be just, just sex outside of marriage, put, put a filter, put an accountability software on your devices. I have a software on my device, and here, here it's a guardrail. It's not because there's this, I'm, I'm going to certain sites repeatedly. No, it's because if there's ever a day where I give into a temptation, every day in the future, I have a guardrail there. And that also, I have a friend that receives reports. If I were to ever go to a questionable website, they would know about it. Listen, you need guardrails in your life. In a hyper-sexualized culture, you need guardrails in your life. Maybe that guardrail is not watching certain movies or shows. I'm thinking, Jeremy, you're being old school. You're being, you're being too much. No, no. It's, it's loving God enough to protect yourself, protect your marriage, 
from impurity and, and, and sexual sin. Having those guardrails, maybe certain people that you're not gonna spend time with. Examine your life. Are there any things in your life you currently do, people that you currently spend time with, maybe individuals you follow on social media that might cause you to think impure thoughts? I shared last week how I had to change the music I listened to because it created impure thoughts. Examine your life, protect your sexuality, protect your marriage and purity, and establish those guardrails in your life. I know you have a, a story of uh, in our marriage where we kind of had some some guardrails as well as some some intimacy about that. Yeah, so Jeremy and I actually uh, met at a gym, and so it's kind of a sentimental place for me, and it's also just also just a place I value. I love it. And so super spiritual. Gym. <laughs> there was a season, um, you know, that and Jeremy and I before kids, we loved to go to the gym together. And there was a particular season where he came to me and he was like, hey, just want to be honest with you. Um, I'm, I'm going to just kind of not go to the gym for a while. And I was like, what? Like, I, I don't understand because it also had some emotional ties. Right. It was like a place that was something we did together. We bonded together. And um, he told me, he's like, hey, I just can't go right now in this season because this is a particular, like, I'm, I'm struggling in this area of lust. And I just want to be honest with you because I don't want it to get a foothold in our marriage. And I am putting this guardrail up. And can I tell you, you know, was it hard to hear that? Yeah, of course. Um, but after that, I think it just drew us so much closer. And it really, what it did was it opened up this just open communication. And when you bring things into the light, then it doesn't get a, 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 a foothold in your life because we're, he, he's being accountable to, to, you know, another man in his life. But he was also accountable to me. And he was like, hey, like, I love you too much. I'm doing this. And yeah, it means we can't work out for a while. But you know what? I, this is why I'm doing it. And can I tell you just the emotional intimacy that happened because of his transparency and his honesty? That's good. You know, secrecy will kill intimacy. Transparency fuels intimacy. As uncomfortable as it might be, we have this open relationship to where there's, there's, there's any clear temptation. We're, we're open with that about each other. It's important, listen, for you because Jesus said temptations will come. So we, everyone's tempted. Let's just get that on, on, the, on the table. <laughs> be open about it with your spouse because here's why. The enemy works and thrives in darkness. He loves secrets. He loves it. And he'll try to tell you, don't tell your spouse that. They can't know that. Listen, you need, and I would recommend, you need to have that transparency with your spouse. And you need to have other people in your life as well that you have that transparency with. Because, listen, when you bring it to light, it reveals the enemy's cards. And it, and it, it, it disempowers him in your life. Let me give you in your marriage. Christina brought it up, but how do you cultivate intimacy? Three Levels of intimacy. I want to encourage you to cultivate your marriage. First is cultivate spiritual intimacy. Psalms 119.9. This is David saying, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. In verse 11, he says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Listen, do that on an individual level, but do that as a couple. When we first got married, one of the things we would do that I thought was so helpful is at dinner we would ask each other, hey, what has the Lord been speaking to you? In your time with God today, what did God speak to you about? And that would cultivate this rich conversation spiritually. Um, we would do marriage studies together. And one of the things that really helped us was being a part of community groups. Uh, and we have a marriage faith and life course. We have a nearlywed, newlywed course. We have a number of groups. We have a marriage night group. Uh, in fact, we're going to be co-hosting together. Um, get involved, get around other couples. And for some of you, you actually maybe have not witnessed a healthy marriage. Maybe you did not see your parents have a healthy marriage. You need to get around couples that have healthy marriages because we often replicate what we have observed. And I want you to catch this. The, journal, the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality Journal found that couples who pray together, again, talking about spiritual intimacy, have higher rates of trust and lower rates of infidelity. And then those who attend church together or come on, come to our outdoor service on the 24th, watch church at home. They We're have, served together like our amazing, <laughs> amazing dream team behind the scenes. They have higher rates of marital satisfaction and commitment. Come on, I want to encourage you, cultivate spiritual intimacy. Number two is to cultivate emotional intimacy. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I want to encourage you, just real quick, I want you to lean into this. 
Confess your sin to each other. When you maybe use a tone that you know could have been hurtful, circle back, be humble enough, say, hey, I'm sorry. The tone I used was wrong. If you said some words that were hurtful, come back, confess it. Hey, I'm sorry. If you're a little bit prideful, come back. I'm telling you, it's going to begin to open up intimacy in your life. And, and, and here's, here's the powerful thing about intimacy. When you begin to have this conversation, in fact, it was, it was found in a journal called the Sexual Medicine Journal in 2012, that actually emotional intimacy is highly correlated with sexual satisfaction in married couples. That there's something powerful when you begin to cultivate that intimacy. Uh, let me just give one practical before, before we move to the next section. Uh, have a weekly date at least once a week, whether it's if in this season, they put the kids to bed early to have some time in the evening. And here's a question we have found to be so helpful is to ask each other, how are you doing? How's your soul? How's your heart? And allow that. Sometimes that's, that takes up an hour and a half of our date. And that's, that's just that, cut that question. We begin to cultivate that intimacy with one another, which brings us to the final level of intimacy, which is sexual intimacy. Cultivate sexual intimacy. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19. Some of you uh, will be surprised this is in the Bible, but it is God's word. Let, the wife, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Um, I don't know if those affirmations are as translatable today. Uh, but let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. The Bible says be satisfied with your wife's breasts. There you go. Come on. That, some of you, that was worth uh, tuning into church today, is you are called biblically to enjoy your wife's breasts. Okay, we'll move on because some of you are getting uncomfortable with that. But, but let me just give you a practical. Here's how you can cultivate sexual intimacy in your marriage. Number one, pray over your sexuality. Uh, in all, all honesty, I pray every day for our, our sex life. I do. And I think you should, because here's why. You don't got to look too far in statistics. The enemy is warring against sex. The rates of infidelity, of pornography, um, you can go on and on. Pray over it. Pray over it. Number two, take turns focusing on each other's needs. Serve one another. Focus on your spouse's needs when it comes to it. And then lastly is be romantic in your spouse's love language all day long. You see the Proverbs, you're, you're like a loving deer. Come on, a graceful doe. Speak your spouse's love language. If you haven't taken the five love languages assessment, I would encourage you to do so. But speak their language all day long. Come on, sex doesn't begin in the bedroom. Come on, sometimes it begins in the kitchen doing those dishes. Come on, somebody. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, I remember when you first got married, there, there's probably heard this, that like, you know, women are like a crock pot, men are like a microwave. And we, I learned this early in marriage because I'd come home from work and, you know, we'd have dinner and, you know, we're ready to have a relationship. And uh, what I learned was that with Christina, uh, that, that analogy was true. And I learned what helped was cultivating intimacy, emotional intimacy throughout the day. And I would text her throughout the day, hey, how's your work day going? How'd that meeting go? And texting her. And then now with three kids... It's like doing the dishes. It's like bathing the kids. And, and those things, find your spouse's love language and speak it. Listen, I want to end with this. A great marriage, a healthy marriage, a God-centered marriage does not happen by accident. It won't. It happens and it requires intentional effort. Intentional effort. So I want to encourage you promise to pursue your spouse. Promise to be about we, not me. Promise to confide in your spouse, not hide from your spouse. We want to close with uh, praying over our our couples this morning. So if you're with your spouse, uh, you can take their hand at this moment. And we just want to pray over you together. Absolutely. And for those of you who are maybe still waiting, 
right, for your spouse and it's a deep desire of your heart or maybe you are completely satisfied in your singleness or perhaps uh, you are apart from your spouse, I just want you to know that God knows exactly where you're at and I want you to know that he is very, he, he just knows, he knows. And so I want you to talk to him during this time as we pray. So Father, I just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the institution of family and marriage and we thank you, Father, but we don't always understand your ways. We know that they are higher than ours. And we know that you have plans that are good for us, plans to to prosper us, Father God, uh, that our soul would prosper, Father, not to harm us. Father, and so we just ask you, Father, that you would put a hedge of protection around our marriages today. Lord, we, we commit ourselves to you all over again, Father, that we would glorify you in every aspect of our life, especially our marriages, the marriages that will come and even those in singleness. Father, God, we ask you that you would help us to fall in love with you more so that we can love one another well. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, if you're here, and Christina mentioned it, but part of having a healthy marriage, a God-centered marriage, uh, is surrendering your life to him. And can I, can I tell you this? Marriage is a depiction of his love for for us. And he loves you. He desires a relationship with you. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do so today. It is the best decision you'll ever make. For some of you, you're coming back to faith. You're feeling God stirring you, drawing you back. You need to recommit your life to him. Just pray this prayer with me right where you are. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and giving your life for me. I believe you rose again. I confess you are Lord of my life. I repent of my sin. I ask that you lead me and you guide me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, if you made that decision, we'd love to know about it. We'd love to send you a resource, help you grow in your faith. You can text the word faith to 94,000. We'd love to send you that information. I'd love to send you that resource as well as some next steps. And we encourage you to get involved in a group or a faith and life course. We actually have a Foundations of Faith course, really a, a Christianity 101 course that'll be perfect for you in this season. And as always, Catalyst family, show them some love in the chats because we are so excited for this decision.